after this morning's sermon about Anna um, being a prophetess, what would be the difference between Anna being a prophetess and a modern day woman preacher? And um, I think that they normally, like a modern day woman minister, would sometimes they go back to the, the story about Anna and say, well, here's the, here's the proof for it. But it seems to fly in the face of what um, Paul teaches. So that's my question, very simple. No, no, uh, it is, it is. In fact, all of these questions are simple to someone, but uh, not to me. Uh, but I'll go in reverse order. Remember, God's, God would never uh, authorize something in one context that he would not authorize in another. So there is a gift of prophecy uh, that's given to the church, and it, it appears... Um, in 1 Corinthians, when you read in chapter 12, when you read in Romans, when you read the gift list, there was a gift of prophecy. Most of us think of prophecy as, um, come on, I'm not supposed to talk to it. There we go. Uh, there's two kinds of prophecy. There's a prophecy that is like in 1 Peter, where it says, holy men of God, and you can read that in 1 Peter 1. Let me just uh, go with this and kind of tie it down to some verses. Uh, 1 Peter 1, and uh, verse 11 Searching water, what manner of time, the Spirit of Christ was in them indicated beforehand the sufferings of Christ. And in verse 10, um, so that's 1 Peter uh, 1, 10 and 11. And here, prophecy is God's Spirit uh, prompting people to write down what we would call the Bible. This is what we would say in theology is revelatory. In other words, uh, this is what Paul calls the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So there was this form of prophecy, and we have 12 minor prophets, we have three major prophets, we have other non-writing prophets, speaking prophets, and all of them got revelation from God. All of them. And all of them were men. There were women prophets. You know them. Uh, Deborah, uh, Huldah, uh, Miriam, and um, I mentioned this morning, uh, you know, Anna would, would be an Old Testament prophet mentioned in the New Testament. None of these had anything to do with writing Scripture. They all spoke truth that was known on God's behalf. What's interesting is Deborah did not address the nation of Israel. She sat under a tree, if you read about it, in Judges 6 through 8. And people that wanted to know what God had said, she explained it to them. But she allowed Barak, or Barak, you might call him, to be out in front. Even uh, the same thing, uh, Huldah, People went to her and asked her questions. She never, ever presumed to come up in front and, and to discuss, you know, the leadership of the nation. Uh, Miriam, by the way, might be an example of someone that got a little out of hand because after she led in, in Exodus 12 onward, the, the dancing and tambourine women's brigade singing, she went on to question Moses' leadership and got leprosy if you remember the story. So Deborah was a, a positive one that never outstepped her bounds. So was Huldah. Miriam was half and half. Anna, the same for the fourth one, never is seen. She didn't go in the temple and start teaching everybody and saying, God tells you to do this. Wherever she was, she repeated what God said. So what I'm saying is there's two kinds of prophets. Now when we get to the New Testament, when you look at the gift of prophecy that's in the uh, gift list, well, I can't write that low, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, when, when it talks about some are given the gift of prophecy, 
there is a, a great, and, and even Wayne Grudem, uh, who has written the systematic theology, who would be classified as charismatic, even he explains the gift lists uh, far differently than the, what we would call the fringe charismatics, uh, the people that are the Toronto blessing, the Brownsville people, the ones that bark and roll and all that crazy stuff they do. That's the fringe. But the mainline assemblies of God, you know, the AG, and just conservative charismatics, uh, they would say that prophets, the gift of prophecy is not giving biblical telling the future. It's for example, this is one way that, that Wayne Grudem would define this prophecy to get back to what uh, uh, Linda's asking uh, by way of Joel, which was very biblical. It says, if you have a question, have your husband ask it. That was just very 1 Corinthians 14. -y. Uh, God never has called any woman. There are 40 authors of the Bible. All of them are men. Not because God is opposed to women. They are the crown, and we're going to get to that with uh, Ken's question. Uh, they, they are vital. But God in his order does not want, in fact, uh, uh, let me just show you something here in 1 Corinthians 11 because, uh, in fact, turn there with me because I want to show you that everything actually ties together in the Bible. If, if you want to know if something is right, just do the test if, if it's, if it's in harmony with the scriptures because one author wrote all of the Bible and he doesn't contradict himself. So in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, starting in verse 3, uh, the Lord says something very interesting. He says, the head of every man is Christ. That's the authority over him. And the head of woman is man. Now, you know what's so interesting the whole egalitarian feministic movement that reinterprets the Bible, they even have their own editions of the Bible. The NIV, you know, has a feminized version. That's why it's just so hard nowadays when people say the Bible says, you go, what Bible are you talking about? Are you talking about the Bible got inspired or all these catered versions, uh, the, the gender, you know, neutral Bible that doesn't have God as Father and all that stuff? That's not the Bible. That's a... I mean, that's close to the Jehovah's Witness New World edition that, that doctors out things. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is not speaking uh, culturally. He is speaking very clearly in, in a revelatory way. And he says that, I want you to know the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So, there is what we call hierarchy with God. This is God the Father, this is God the Son, this is man, and this is woman. And, you know, if you want to just keep adding to it, uh, you know, children. And children are to learn to honor and respect their mother and to honor and respect their father, and they are supposed to, through their parents, that's what we were doing with the dedication, learn to honor and respect Christ, and thus... All things will be when Christ delivers them under God and he shall be all in all, as 1 Corinthians 15 says. And so this is the hierarchy. Now look, look what we've come to in our society. And, and before I get to Ken, I'll just say that, that this has nothing to do with his question, but this is where our culture is going. We have so much wanted this whole uh, equal rights thing that many families have gone to the woman leading and the man uh, actually, he's not even there, to tell you the truth. Uh, the children are there because children are so important. And the man is here with the um, passive male syndrome, I call it, PMS. He has the passive male syndrome. The children have the confused child syndrome. And the woman has the, the displaced role syndrome because no matter what teaching you have, this is, this is what God says. And God said, this is what is operative in the home and in the church. 
this, this 1 Corinthians 11 and other places is what God has ordained. Now, he doesn't say that it's the role in business or government. It, it doesn't, the, the scriptures don't, you know, they give nice principles about how to be a good businessman, businesswoman, or whatever, but it never says that women can't lead in any role or can't be crackerjack, Proverbs 31, very profitable businessmen. Uh, in fact, most women are incredible money managers, what they can do on, on taking care of a home uh, as far as all the, the needed purchases and everything else there. But within the home, God's order is supposed to be followed. Uh, this is not God's order. This pro produces children. You talk about confusion. If this is what God says, and if this is what's operating in their home, you know what pretty soon they think? It doesn't matter what God says. And that's the confusion we've gotten to. So what does that have to do with Joel's question? Well, what the Lord says is, if, if you keep going, um, you can read the, the rest of uh, 1 Corinthians 11 um, because it, it just keeps talking about the order of the church. But when you get down to uh, 1 Corinthians 14, it, it, I mean, if, if we get to the spiritual gifts tonight, what, what the Lord is saying is he wants within the church for, uh, for it to be that the men teach and lead. That's basically uh, what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians, starting in 11, in 12, in 14, and in 1 Timothy 2 that we saw last week, or last time that I did this. In the home, he wants Ephesians 5, the men to be the Christ-like leaders. That doesn't mean the ruler. It doesn't mean the, the king. It means a Christ-like servant leader. But never, never are we to um, forget this. So what happens when we have... I'm going to get a lot of exercise tonight. Uh, what happens when we have uh, a woman preacher? modern-day women preacher. Well, God would never gift a woman to do something he's already said is wrong. He's already said that the woman is to be under the headship of the man who is under the headship of Christ, who is under God the Father. What happens is, because the family has slowly degenerated, the church is following. No matter how many special experts you bring in to say that there are seven ways of interpreting the Bible according to Jewish thought, the Bible does not say this. Never. In any part of the Bible. Every prophetess, every, every New Testament church was was to be organized this way except when they were in disobedience. So what has happened nowadays? The majority of, of what we would say American, the 100 million Christians in America have a disobedient form of their family structure. And a growing percentage of the churches, of the 330,000 churches in America, are having women elders and women pastors. And especially... Sadly, in this whole realm of modern-day women preachers in the charismatic movement. And, and, I mean, even a case in point here in town, one of the largest churches in our town has a man who can't preach very well and a wife who can. And everybody knows that. And they are a team. But the Bible says that they're disobedient and that she should not be teaching the gathered church. And we've already covered that in a different one. So to answer the question, Joel and Linda, the prophetess has no comparison to the modern-day women preachers because the modern-day women preachers 
are disobedient to the pattern, not only that the New Testament lays down, but to the pattern that the Old Testament laid down. There were no revelatory women prophets in the Old Testament. There was one, got a little out of hand, and God smote her with leprosy, prophetess. But there was no um, revelatory writing scripture uh, moved by the Holy Spirit to write scripture. Now, what is modern day gift of prophecy? Charismatics. Remember I told you Wayne Grudem's charismatic and we're studying his systematic theology. Do you know what he calls, uh, for example, a, a subset of the gift of prophecy is the word of knowledge. Do you know what he calls that? He calls it a spontaneous bringing to memory a previously learned scripture. We've all experienced that. So we're all in that form charismatic, if that's charismatic. How many times have you been talking to someone on the phone, walking with someone, seeing someone in the supermarket, and they, they are struggling with something, and you remember a verse you learned in Awana about 300 years ago, and you just share it with them. And you go, wow, that was the Lord. See, the, the Holy Spirit is at work. But when the Holy Spirit is at work, he always follows his own rules. The Holy Spirit will never break his own rules, what he's written down in the scripture, because that causes confusion.